Good time of day to you, my chess friends. This is Grandmaster Alex Shermalinsky. Welcome back, whatever the Russian schoolboy knows. Well, this month in October, I'm gonna take us away from the usual endgame grind. Although I understand that endgame play is what coined the phrase, whatever the Russian schoolboy knows. But there are other things to learn and well, enjoy as well. Let's talk about uh, queen sacrifices. And uh, by that I don't mean a brilliant finish when you give your queen a couple of checks and then it's made. Um, let's talk about more of a positional kind. Uh, I, I probably should even avoid the term sacrifice. It's just a material configuration. Uh, when the one side has certain compensation for the queen. We're going to look at this from both sides of the aisle, if you wish, in the spirit of the upcoming presidential debate, maybe. Okay, let's not talk politics here. Uh, yeah, why do we give a queen and what do we get for the queen? Uh, let's just look at some examples. Now, let's turn our attention to the board. And uh, this is a game I played a long time ago, uh, defending the white side of the Batwinic variation. And my opponent in this position went knight e5. It was known to me prior to this game that white is supposed to sacrifice the queen. And I did it, well, simply because that I, I knew it was the right move. Uh, I knew very little about the resulting position and what I, what I did, I, I had to I had to learn during the game. It all actually starts even from this point. Um, white can take, of course, with either rook. And I took with the A rook, which, uh, which is... No, it sort of leaves the queen side unattended. And I don't really see much of benefit uh, of uh, keeping the rook on f1, except for one thing that I... I believe is essentially important for this kind of position. That's the safety of your king, because the queen is the is at her best when your king is open. And just having that rook on f1 just seemed sturdier. However, I must admit now that the other capture is probably more efficient. I was also thinking when I took with the a rook, and uh, that thinking persisted. Because then I had another game in which I did the same. That somehow white could use the pawns as sort of bait for the white, for the black queen. And get the queen out there. Get the queen busy with the pawns while white is uh, trying to accomplish his goals. Alright, so my opponent, uh, Machowski, was a good player. He unfortunately did not pursue his uh, chess career and instead... Uh, choosing, well, some other maybe more loc lucrative fields, but uh, he was a good player when he played. He answered immediately with b4, and in reply to my move knight e4, he went for the pawns with the queen. Well, when you think of your compensation for the queen, uh, well, a sturdy pawn structure is is necessary. It's really hard to to restrain the queen when the when you don't have a pawn chain. And a well advanced pawns is that what you usually need. Uh, try to put the opponent's pieces on the defensive. So from that point of view, I obviously valued my e5 pawn way over the a2 pawn. And in this position, I I played the move bishop f4. Well, is it possible here to take the pawn on a2? Of course, and that's actually what I counted on. Now, when you play against the Batwinic variation, well, the f7 pawn has to be in your sights. So the move knight g5 then comes in. Once the foundation of the black position, the f7 pawn is gone, well, then the f6 pawn, of course, will become important. Uh, okay, let's look. Who's gonna get what? Well, each side has like four 
connected bus points. Well, this kind of stuff, when it happens, usually, usually favors the side with the pieces. Because, no, you're probably going to have to give up some pieces for the opponent's pawns. And with equal ease, you can part with the bishop as with the queen. So you actually have more pieces to give up for the pawns. So the general should be a good development for it. Uh, I was thinking in my calculations that in reply to rook g8, white should probably not go knight d6 check, uh, but rather play this move with the idea of eliminating the e6 pawn. Now the pieces could be very effective going against the opponent's king. Uh, with the move knight d8, white actually plans not only to advance the pawns, but also he's thinking of uh, somehow getting the getting the bishop to come from h3 at the right moment. Uh, or obviously after knight takes a6, there'll be uh, there'll be a threat of rook d8 mate. So somehow keep the black king there. Now the safety of the kings. Uh, it becomes really a paramount factor. In this position, although I cannot support it with, with variations, I do believe that white is very close to winning. Apparently, so did think my opponent, who, if I recall, spent quite a bit of time and played this move. Well, his idea becomes immediately visible. If white goes knight g5, then black will give the exchange back. Now, when you get ready to play those positions with uh, rook and minor piece for a queen, um, you should realize that uh, the traditional material considerations uh, can, be, can be set aside, can be pushed aside. Uh, because it's already unbalanced with the queen on one side and the rook and the minor piece on the other side. So in this situation, of course, black accomplishes a lot. So he takes the pawn on e5 and gets rid of the knight that was threatening f7. And uh, still he has his uh, eyes set on b2. I believe black's doing great in this position. Now the h pawn. Yeah, for the queen, you can never tell because obviously, obviously, black still keeps uh, keeps his queen. That could probably stop the h pawn and prevent it from going too far. Not to mention that the best h pawn can do is to win the win the black bishop on h6, and by that time, if the white queen side is all lies in ruins, then uh, he will have very little to uh, to be cheerful about. No, it's clear to me that knight g5 is not the right move. Uh, what white needs to be doing instead, he needs to try to take advantage of the departing uh, black rook and uh, try to start his attack and possible infiltration to the d8 square. So I played logically rook d4, inviting the following variation. And it happened. c5. I took... Oh, I didn't blunder. Did not blunder. I saw it. Uh, I saw this coming. Now, black is about to win the exchange, which, which will, will increase sort of his nominal material advantage to a queen versus two pieces. But uh, at a very steep cost. Because his pawns are going to be lost. I guess that was an error on uh, Machowski's part to allow this to happen. Well, well, the rest of the game was sort of marred by his very bad time trouble. But I think even if best play, which probably would be uh, moving the king to d8, he was naturally afraid of that because it seems like it was very close to checkmate. Uh, but, um, well, white likes the queen for that, so 
you can take a lot of liberties with your king. More about that later when, when you have a queen. But it has to be well calculated, of course. Uh, in this position, however, White uh, should not try to hunt down that king with, with checks and uh, well, he needs to build up slowly. And the best way to start is with the move h4. Well, since the black king is going to be confined to the 8th rank, it is very attractive for, for white just to drive the rook back and keep it there out of play on h8. Well, the, the black queen also tied up to the defense of this, of this bishop, so a logical attempt would be to play something like, uh, what to look at, let's look at bishop c4. Um, also bishop d5 uh, coming up. Um, yeah, likely the side with the queen is interested in exchanges because the less clutter on the board, uh, the more powerful the queen is, the more squares can the queen access. In this situation, however, white can once again attack the attack the f7 pawn, and I think that's very important. Now this is a double attack, and in reply to this, knight takes f7. Well, white king safe enough, even with the disappearance of the its faithful guardian, the g2 bishop, and I uh, think white is going to combine his threats with the f pawn and very effectively. I don't think that black really uh, has the time to to win the b2 pawn. Probably, probably he doesn't, so that means that his counterplay is going to be severely restricted. White should be winning here. Well, nonetheless, probably king d8 was better. Machulski played king b8 and brought the bishop back, but look at that king, and just Constantly there in the in danger in the white pieces. So I played in this position rook c4. Well, what helps white in this situation that the uh, the time is on his side. Given time, he can easily improve. He can play h4. He can play bishop f3. He can move the king up, he can advance the h-pawn, possibly even the g-pawn. So black is under pressure, accomplished something. So Machilski took the pawn, just hoping to, to get something going. Um, well, this is good timing, so at no moment uh, that planned exchange sacrifice on the 5 could take place. So once I've driven them back, I think this is a comfortable advantage for White. And uh, as I said already, he was in time trouble. But I repeated some moves, uh, just to be careful. Now the bishop comes to e3, with the purpose of further restricting uh, the, the king there. For example, if this, then it's possible that white can, can play rook takes a7. Once again, trying to get to the, uh, to the f7 pawn. And of course, in the capture loses the queen and white has huge material advantage that he cannot possibly blow this one. So yeah, that would be real nice. Um, so he couldn't do this, and he played instead his rook to d8. Well, the h pawn. It's very common for the Batwinic variation for white to combine the threats on the queen side with this steady advance of the h pawn. I will just walk you through the moves because there's really black. Black has very little hope. Uh, but this move alone tells the story that uh, how dominating the the white minor pieces were. So black is just willing to give up a rook just to just to do something. Well, it's still not enough, of course. Um, 
Well, the queen had to stay there, otherwise the h pawn is going too far. But now the bishop on e6 is lost. After playing this last move, my opponent overstepped the, the time limit on the last move. Uh, didn't didn't make his move for it, but of course it's totally lost. This Grandmaster Damien Lemos. First of all, I hope you enjoyed um, this video. If you would like to receive more free chess videos from us, you can just click the subscribe button below. I would also highly recommend signing up for my free mail course, The 10 Grandmaster Secrets to Dominate Chess. During this exclusive course from OnlineChessLessons.net, I'll share with you my own Grandmaster shortcuts to effective attacking, defending and growth hacks to improving your chess without um, complicated books or memorization. So sign up by clicking the sidebar on the right and I know you won't be disappointed. Once more this is Damien uh, for OnlineChessLessons.net and I'll see you um, in my videos. Thank you.